Hello and welcome to the first ever episode of The Build Podcast. My name is Oliver Crocker. I'm going to be tracking down and interviewing your favourite stars from Sun Hill. And what a way to kick off. We've got one of the true legends of The Bill, the most dashing CID officer of all time... It's Mr. John Isles. John, welcome to The Bill Podcast. Thank you very much, Oliver. It's a pleasure. Now, I've lucked out here because normally when these podcasts are done at a distance, audio quality is a bit of a luxury. So can you tell me why we're listening to your dulcet tones and such crisp quality? Where am I talking to you from? Well, you are talking to me in a home studio, a professional setup that I share with a great friend of mine who's also a voiceover artist. He's younger, so we don't clash, so there's no rowing and screaming. But he facilitates me being able to record uh, remotely. And that's where I am now. And that's why the sound quality is good. I'm not on a phone or something. <laughs> yes. And, and you've become one of the UK's most prolific voiceover artists. You've shown that there is life after Sun Hill in a really cool way. Absolutely. I got into the voice work through Chris Ellison, who played yeah. Burnside. And Chris was with a particular agency, and he suggested me to them because I used to do award ceremonies at the at our Christmas parties. I used to write award ceremonies, and we'd give out, you know, really dodgy awards for <laughs> appalling acting and, you know, the best corpser because everybody corpsed <laughs> on that show. And Chris put me in contact with his agency. I got on with them, got on very well, and that's how I got into the voiceover work. And to be honest, things did go quiet after the bill, but it was supplemented by... A lot of voice work. Yeah. Um, I revoiced a whole load of disaster documentaries, like, you know, What Went Wrong, Storm Warning, um, Inferno, which is a personal favourite, just lots of fires <laughs> all over the world. You go, well, one fire pretty well looks much like the next, but I had to make it sound exciting. You know, oh, look, another fire. Yeah. <laughs> Where's this one? <laughs> but yeah, and I've just stuck with it. Um, I love it. I love the work. I do a lot of corporate. I cornered a market in a lot of teaching modules, which I love doing. You know, there's an element of you read some of the things and it's about um, international marine law. Right. And you go, that's fun. Um, and you think, actually, it is fun because you think of these poor students stuck in the bowels of some enormous merchant ship sailing around the world. And you've got to make it interesting. You know, and it's a very dry subject. There's, it's a challenge. It's an acting challenge. And so I've just stuck with it. I'm very happy now. Being down here in the West Country as I am, I, I just love doing the voice work. It fits in w really well with my life. Having such an extensive acting background must really help with voice work. And anyone listening to this should check out John's SoundCloud profile because there's some absolute crackers on there. <laughs> Uh, Ch Charlie, it's... little Charlie, was a favourite of track of mine. Ch I know, I know you like Charlie, <laughs> and uh, it's such a funny thing. It was for a, a, an American greetings card company, and and won all sorts of rave reviews. It was so funny, but that's a very good point because the twenty five, thirty years acting experience before I even went into voice work means I can do character acting um, that an awful lot of voiceovers can't do. Mm. Because they, they've never been actors. So I can do character voices. I can do, you know, if I'm asked to do conversational or, you know, a different style of read, I can do it because I've been doing that all my life. Yeah. And, and I heard you in action in a video game recently, Enderal. Yeah, Enderal. I didn't even know how to pronounce it. <laughs> so luckily I didn't have to say it. <laughs> but yeah, it wasn't a huge bit. There's an interesting acting problem with that because they actually asked me to play the lead. Right. Which is... Half man, half machine, don't ask me why. Um, <laughs> and I pulled all the stops out and did this. Oh, I thought it was this sensational voice, this great growling growl. It's like this. <laughs> He's lived in the bowels of the world for 30,000 years. I did all this. Wow. <laughs> did a lot of work on it. And it came back and they went, no, 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 no. Can't, can he just do it in his ordinary voice? Oh. <laughs> I said, no, no. actually. Yeah. It just bore me witless to do the, the, the great long speeches. I, but I played another part. I said, I'll do a smaller part. 
But that's the acting side. And I love it. I love all that sort of stuff. Were there any acting genes in your family? Not at all. My dad was RAF. My brother went into the bank. Um, but I'd always done drama at school. I'd been in school plays. And so when I was 18, with the help of my uh, drama teacher, David Price, who was hugely encouraging, him and his wife, uh, I applied to the Rose Bruford College of Speech and Drama in Sidcup, voted the most boring place on the planet. <laughs> really? <laughs> in consecutive years while I was there. Uh, <laughs> And I went there for three years, and that was in the days when uh, I was 18 then, straight out of school, and that was in the days when you could get a scholarship. Right. So from the council, you wouldn't have even heard of scholarships. But if you got three A-levels, the council would pay your fees. Oh, wow. I know. It's, it's just astonishing, isn't it? <laughs> yes. So I had all my very expensive drama school fees paid by the council. Wow. And Because you could do that in those days. Uh, and that was it. That was how I, I, I set off. I got a teaching qualification with that, which I've never used. But that kept my mum and dad happy. You know, something to fall back on all that. And that, that was it. I, I just up and running. Then started in theatre and education to get a full equity card. You had to do 40 weeks work to get a full equity card. And then did a lot of touring theatre, Shakespeare's number one tours. There were a lot of companies doing tours then, uh, three months at a time. And you got really learning your your trade you'd be an acting asm you'd have a small part and assistant stage manager as well that's how you all started um i never did rep i didn't go into repertory theater uh, but i did touring i went down the commercial route if you like and then got into tv started doing it it was all comedy stuff um never the twain fresh fields uh, the dick emery show People who remember Dick Emery, you are awful, but I like you. I was on the receiving end of one of those. Oh, wow. Um, when he, we were at Leeds Castle, and Dick Emery was dressed as a medieval uh, sort of lady with a huge wimple, and she had, he, he, she, had two Great Danes on Leeds. And I was dressed as a knight <laughs> standing on the edge of the moat. <laughs> and she walked past, and I said... What a fine pair thou hast there. I should dearly love to fondle those two in front of the fire. <laughs> Which, of course, elicited the response, you are awful, but I like you, and she pushed me backwards into the moat. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great, it's one of my first acting jobs. That's why I remember it. So, And I went on to do about three three episodes of Dick Emery's show and... And then other comedies as well. You know, Never the Twain with Windsor Davis and Donald Sinden. There's a lovely scene up on the site there, actually. It's really nice to have the two of them, the legends that they were, to be in a scene. I did To the Manor Born with Penny Keith and then went on to Law and Order with Penny Keith as well when I was a, played a shipwrecked uh, sailor who's in court accused of eating his uh, <laughs> shipmate. It's all very odd. I can't actually remember how it turned out. But... It's a very interesting concept, isn't it, when you're acting for television but in front of a live studio audience. That, that, yes. must, be, that must be a hell of a buzz. Really? Well, buzz, buzz forward slash terror. It was so scary. I mean, doing live theatre was scary enough, but you get into the swing of it after a week. You know, you're in the routine and it's not scary anymore. Doing live it's a sitcom as live in front of an audience. You don't have time to settle into the role. You know, it's one night and it is terrifying. It's so scary. I, I don't know how I did it, to be honest now, because I look back on it and it makes me go cold. Well, you did it very well. Well, it was, I, I loved it. And that was the route I was going to go down. My very first job, TV acting job, was Crown Court, which is a show that, well, they should bring that back. It's, it's such a great idea. You have three episodes a week, a whole court case in the courtroom, and the jury is made up of members of the public. And we record two different endings for a guilty or a not guilty verdict, or we rehearse two endings. It's a brilliant concept. And I played a, a, a nightclub bouncer, which I, I've, <laughs> I've since seen it. And it's the poshest northern... <laughs> bouncer i've ever seen i mean it was just ridiculous <laughs> it was ridiculous but but that was my first job that was with joan, joan sims, sims yeah. from um, uh, the carry on films walter gottel the russian villain in the bond movies yeah you know michael elphick extraordinary people you know legends and 
people like Joan Sims, she wouldn't mind me saying this, she was terrified. Because you did it as live. You had to, with the members of the public sitting in the jury. You did it as if it was a play. And you were surrounded by cameras that would appear and then disappear as another camera picked you up. Obviously, they couldn't look at each other, the cameras. So they have, there were panels in the courtroom that would slide out and the camera would disappear and then the panel would slide. It was just bizarre. It's like being on a set of Star Trek or something. But that's really, that's how I went. And then the bill came along. It was just another cop show. It was a couple of episodes. It was no big deal. I went along and did it, thoroughly enjoyed it. And then it turned into the, the Pantecticon that it became. And it, it detracted me. It took me away from a burgeoning comedy career, which is the direction I wanted to go in. But you brought a lot of comedy to the role of Mike. I tried. I, mean, I tried. He was a dry old <laughs> sot, wasn't he? It was quite an impenetrable sense of humour in many ways, but it's the more discerning viewer got it. The less discerning, like Charlie Catchpole, one of the reviewers in one of the papers, said that I was trained at the MFI School of Acting. Oh, no, no, no. That's no. harsh. Yeah, yeah, but course. I thought, no, I'm sorry, he's just not bright enough to pick up on the humour. <laughs> when this happened, I mean, had you seen Wooden Top, the pilot? Was the bill on your radar at all? As... No, no. And, and of course, Wooden Top, you're right, uh, Mark Wingate playing Carver, the start of a career in police was, but yeah, a Wooden Top is a new copper. I hadn't seen it. I don't think I ever have, actually. I hadn't been aware of it, because, of course, it was just a one-off. And I, I just missed it. So it was just a, it was a new cop show to me. What were the cop shows you grew up with? Oh, Dixon and Doc Green. Yeah. Which, you know, most of your listeners, what they won't have a clue what that is. <laughs> oh, I think you'd be surprised. I think. Well, I think... you know, the <laughs> traditional copper with his, with his Andy Crawford, his detective sidekick, and they, they solved crime in the most wonderfully homespun way. You know, those little tinkling police cars, little panda cars with the little bells going. I loved all that. It wasn't because it was novel. It's because that's what I grew up with, you know. I was growing up in the 60s, and that's what it was. And then the, and Andy Crawford, played by Peter Byrne, I then went on to do the, do a couple of summer seasons with. Fantastic. And the man was a legend. I'd grown up watching this guy on TV. Yeah. And he was a lovely guy. He's a lovely guy. Am I right that you were only initially booked for two episodes? Yeah, it was two or three. I can't remember. You probably know better than me, Oliver. It was two, two or three. It wasn't a big booking. I've even got my diary oh. of, of the time. I used to keep a diary. You wouldn't think it was anything. Just go, oh, got a, got a casting today, um, some new cop show. Wow. Got to go up to town. And, and that was it. And then a few days later... Got the cop show, yeah. and that, that was it. That was all it was. It was no, you know, ah, oh, wow, this is really exciting. It was just another little TV job. Well, I have a theory about this, because I think it was the same for Tony Scannell, that he and you were both booked for, like, two or three episodes, and then there was an episode called Long Odds, where you and Tony have to take on Sean Bean and a accomplice in a robbery. Yeah, in a corner shop. That's right. That was Sean Bean's first acting job. He had to hit me with a hammer. That's right. With a rubber hammer. And he couldn't do it. He, <laughs> he couldn't do it. He kept, he, he'd sort of give me a little tap on the head. And I can remember turning around and saying, it's not a real hammer, you know. <laughs> you, that's why it's made of rubber. Now hit me. And yeah. it, was, it was really funny. Well, Tony does like a karate kick that Jean-Claude Van Damme would have been jealous of. I, mean, <laughs> I it, don't remember that. It's an amazing fight scene, even by today's standards. It's an incredible... And I, I'd love to think that it was that scene that everyone watched and thought, they've got something special here. Could well have been. There was a lot of... I think there was a lot of rewriting and rearranging, because obviously the series was already written. And I wonder how much was... Right, come on, that, that character, we want to pull him up. That one's not working. Bring in that one. I, 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 we're not, as actors, you're never privy to that sort of stuff. So I, I don't know what happened. But you could well be right. I've read as well that in your first take, you tripped over and fell into a filing cabinet. So I don't know if you have any recollection of that. That's, uh... None whatsoever. But I have... I've been clumsy most of my life. <laughs> that would figure. I think I, I do actually remember. I think I tripped over a cable. Yes, that's what I've got in, in Tony Lynch's book all about the bill in the, oh, right. the first 10 years. It's, it's a cracker, yeah. <laughs> tripped, tripped over a cable. How similar are you 
I'm guessing not very, to Mike Dashwood. What what appealed to you about playing him? Genuinely, it was a. I liked it as a character because it was a. He's a black sheep. I didn't have to try and put on a Cockney accent or any of that nonsense. I would. I'd been in theatre doing playing a lot of sort of not posh because I'm not posh, um, and they didn't want that. They wanted. A guy obviously gone to grammar school type level. Parents had great expectations. We always thought his parents were like probably doctors, something like that. Expected him to do something uh, in that line, a a doctor or an academic of some sort. And he didn't. He went into the police force. And of course, the family just disowned him for it. But in my mind, that explained why he had flash cars and very expensive suits (laughs) and all that. He had money behind him and it made him a black sheep in the police force as well but i i was always sad when they got fed up with him you know when they they, in 92 when they got rid of him because you think on his own the character it's not all bells and whistles fireworks like Mm. the scannels like the burnsides but the point about him is that it's the essence of drama is conflict and and he was he was like a fly in the ointment. He wound people up. Yeah. And he didn't have to do a lot to bring out those explosions in other characters. And I don't think they appreciated what a good cog he was in that CID department. But that's sour grapes. But, but you, do you know what I mean? It's, he was better written than I think people gave credit for. Barry Appleton was one of my favourite writers. He loved Dashwood. And he wrote fabulous scripts. The the whole, the Black Panther one, Ebony the Panther, that was Barry Appleton. Then the one when I was taken hostage and kept on the roof, that was Barry Appleton as well. It was fabulous. There's an episode called Taken Into Consideration. That rings a bell. You've got a suspect played by an actor called Matthew Sim. He's playing a character called Kevin, and everyone knows that Kevin's trouble, but Dashwood hasn't dealt with him before, and everyone's like, oh, here we go, let's see how this goes down, sort of thing. (laughs) And you have a first in the bill, I'm pretty sure about this, you are the first character to ever use a tape machine to record an interview, and they make a big deal of it that you're unwrapping the tape, and he said, what's that? And he said, well, this is is something new, we're going to record the interview... (laughs) I had no recollection of that at all. Yeah, you're the first to ever... How extraordinary. I'm going to dine out on that. Yeah. You say this is DC Dashwood, also in the room is WPC Ackland. And then Matthew Sim leans over and he says, what have you got to say? Hello, mum. You know, that's the gag. And <laughs> yeah. and, and you, you get progressively more wound up. And in the end, you actually slam your fist down on the table. It's the first time we see Dashwood sort of lose his cool, you know. Oh, absolutely. No, that makes that makes sense because he he just didn't. He never he never lost his cool. He was just always so calm. There's a wonderful moment in one of the I don't know why it sort of illustrates that. It's one of my favourite one off moments is when he parks his very smart personal car outside a really grotty estate. <laughs> and it's a beautifully shot one because you see him and you see the car behind him and he's talking to someone. And then suddenly a fridge lands on top of his car. <laughs> and I think he reacts wonderfully. I mean, it's a bit sitcom to be honest, because, you, you know, you'd jump out of your skin, wouldn't you? But he, yeah. we did it acting-wise that he just didn't even turn round and then just yeah. slow burn turns around. <laughs> this fridge has gone straight through the top. I think it was a BMW, I, I remember because it didn't have an engine in it as you can imagine it was it was from a scrap yard and we did it up <laughs> there's, a, there's another great because there was plenty of com- i think that initial uh, when, when it got into the half hour episodes and you've got you and chris ellison tony scallon mark wing it the, the four of you it's like for me the perfect cid lineup and it's, it's a great episode where you come in in like the perfect late 80s suits i mean you know it's it's just really cut and dapper oh i know and they're all they're all ripping into you and and chris ellison says mike and you go yes gov nothing and they all start laughing and then later in that episode you you have a foot chase and you end up in the canal in your brand new suit oh that was that was but that was his country squire yeah that's right that was the tweed jacket and an immaculate yellow waistcoat and 
the hell he was doing wearing that in CID. <laughs> but I remember, and we had to have two jackets. We had one jacket with the sleeve ripped, and because it was the sleeve all got ripped. I, I, kept, I kept that outfit. Oh, did you? I wore that to Buckingham Palace. No. To give out the Duke of Edinburgh awards for the Duke of Edinburgh. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> I did. I wore that outfit. Oh, how magic! Yeah, I got. A, I had the gold Duke of Edinburgh award, and then you know, if you're on the telly, you got an invitation from the palace because he can't give them all out. There's two thousand kids there, and he gets celebs with the gold award, and you're all put in separate rooms, and you have about two hundred, three hundred kids each. And you give out their Duke of Edinburgh awards. And I was wearing that outfit that I fell in the canal in. Oh, smashing. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? You're reminding me of things I haven't thought of for years. Well, I mean, that episode taken into consideration, that was the first time you got top billing. Oh, right. That must have, it must have been a wonderful time in your life where you're in a really successful series. You've got top billing. And... It was glorious. It was absolutely glorious. I cannot tell you what fun it was it was going into work you know and actors moan all the time but it's something that I've I've never forgotten you had to as a as a a comedy training for an actor it sounds bizarre that you had to bring your a game that people like Chris Ellison and Mark and Trudy Goodwin and Eric Richard and all these people have got fantastic senses of humor Mm. You know, they are witty people. And it was like, you almost had to take a deep breath because when you went on set, it was like being in a comedy show. You know, the 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 banter. Yeah. But the level of comedy. And we would get into so much trouble when we were helpless with laughter. <laughs> Absolutely. Clive Wood came in and joined. He's a great actor. Yes. He came in and played a detective or something. He's He's still working now. He's doing lots of work now. Yeah, DCI Ray, yeah. That's right. One of the funniest men I've ever met in my life. Just so funny. And uh, he could reduce me to hysterics. <laughs> to the point where the director is going, Oh, for God's sake, all of you! You're like kids! <laughs> and we're all bit, like giggling like school kids in the kind of... It was, a jo- it was joyous. In terms of you're in a really successful show, did, what difference did that make to your personal life? Did you start getting recognised? Mr- I mean... Yeah, that was, that was, that, that, that was, it was interesting because there was a period where um, the friends I had around me then would tell you I turned into a bit of an ass. to be honest. Um, it just happens when you have that sort of uh, recognition thrust on you. You know, I got a, I got a bit up myself, to be honest. You know, people would come up and say, can I, you know, have an autograph or something like that? And you know, oh, aren't you off the bed? And I'd, I'd be quite short with them and go, you know, I'm, I'm with my friends in the pub. And eventually it took friends to say, you know, you're becoming a bit of an ass, Right. Actually. And luckily they were good enough friends to say that because I've seen it happen a lot of times that people are surrounded by people just creeping up to them, you know, mm. who will never tell them. You know, we've all seen that. But I suppose there's no training for that, is there? Well, exactly. There's no training. But that's when you rely on family and close friends Mm. to take you to one side and say, stop doing that. Stop behaving like that. You know, you're better than that. And if it wasn't for these people, you wouldn't be having a wonderful life, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not brain surgery. I know it's a cliche, but it's not. It's, It's acting. It's going into work, having a real laugh and, you know, being able to afford nicer things in life. But um, I, th- I, th- I then grew into it, and it was lovely. It was lovely. And it, it went on for a long time afterwards. That wasn't so lovely. You know, <laughs> when, I, when I'd left, and I was all bitter and twisted, and people come, Oi, Dashwood! <laughs> yeah. Not yeah. anymore! No. Because <laughs> it wasn't my choice. I didn't want to leave, but I thought I'd be fine. But and it just it didn't work out like that. You know, I did bits and bobs. Mm. Um, I went into Panto then as well, which everybody thinks you know a lot of people look down on, and I can assure you, you shouldn't you shouldn't look down on it. Apart from the fact that it's a great earner if you've been on telly, yeah. But also playing the villain, I'd only play villains, and I just loved it. Yeah. I mean, I did all the you know my heroes, Alan Rickman in Robin Hood. Yeah. The best sheriff of Nottingham ever. stole the film, absolutely, and of course had loads of scenes cut because he was he was outshining Mr. Costner. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Costner. He had 
production control and cut scenes, you know, yes. but still couldn't pull the film back to himself. <laughs> well, I based all my Panto villains on Alan Rickman. And it's just that sarcastic, world-weary, but with that fantastic voice that he'd got. And I, I worked on that, that voice. So it was great. Captain Hook. Abenaza, all, all the same performance, just a different hat. But but I loved it. <laughs> great. Don't bring out the big acting guns, but but the villain drives the piece, you know. And so I, mm. I had a very happy career doing that for about six years. But that's only for a few weeks of the year, and that sort of brings us full circle. Really, that that's why I very happily fell into voiceover work. Yes, and it was by no means a second choice. It was a world that I hadn't been in. Mm. And as soon as I got in it, I just, as you can tell, I love being in a studio. And I've done recording stuff, teaching modules up in London for a particular company, a marine teaching company for merchant seamen around the world. And I could be in the studio for seven hours, yeah. which is, you know, to a lot of people probably, think, oh, well, that's not a lot. But I'll tell you, most voiceover jobs take 15, 20 minutes, mm. you know, so seven hours in a studio yeah, and keeping that energy up as well. Keeping though. the energy, absolutely. This thing about remembering those poor kids stuck in the bowels of a ship. Yeah. But I love it. I love it. And the, and the more tedious the subject sometimes, <laughs> you know. I never forget being given a one about the um, about tarmac. Tarmacking a motorway. And it was about an hour-long training video. And I loved it. It was the <laughs> most boring thing on the planet. And trying to make that engaging it's just fun the harder it is the duller it is the more fun you can have as a voiceover to be honest yeah they're not very glamorous but you know there are plenty of you know glamour jobs as well there's you know if if i might share some of my favorite moments of you and the bill yeah there's an episode called duplicates where they are recreating for for tv Kelly Lawrence is playing a woman who's gone missing. They, they do like a reconstruction. Oh, right. And Tony Scannell sort of lands you with the case. And then the TV crew want to interview you. And you're like, what? Well, no one mentioned that. And then Kelly Lawrence is really, really worried and doesn't want to be on camera. And then you say, Claire, I've got another tie in the car. Do you think this one's OK? And like, you know, she's like, blimey, I'm really terrified about this. And I'm worried about how I look. <laughs> yeah. And then all that's the, very like me. <laughs> all, all the guys in the station watch it on the TV. Or when you come on screen, Ashley Gunstock's character yells, oh, it's James Bond. And they, they all start laughing. How funny. I do remember that. And then, and then the irony of that was only a couple of years after I left, I was meeting Barbara Broccoli in um, the Hilton Hotel in Park Lane, being interviewed for Bond. Wow. We were all up there. I mean, that sounds wonderful. But, you know, every eligible, as it were, young actor in that age range, you know, sort of mid-30s, as it was then, was being hauled in. And especially if you've been on the telly, so you had a, you had a profile. Yeah. But we didn't get past sandwiches. They're lovely sandwiches, but <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't go any further. <laughs> But yeah, nice tie-in. There's an episode called Save the Last Dance for Me where you and oh. Tr yeah, Trudy Goodwin are undercover and you have That's to right. dance. That's right, in a dance class. That's right. That I do remember. That was a good, that was a great episode. And having to learn to dance. Yeah. And, I tell you, and, and also trying to do the dialogue so that every time you came round, you were hitting the camera at the right time. And I'll tell you a funny little connection with that. Roly Luca was the, head, the senior cameraman on the bill. And he, we were on the first floor of a uh, building and he had to sit on the window ledge to capture the whole swirling dance route. If you remember, it's a circle of people. You're dancing in a circle. That's right. And he had to lean back out the window to capture it. The camera simply couldn't, he couldn't expand big enough. And he started falling. Oh. As I came into shot, so I'm glancing peripherally at the camera to make sure I'm in the right place. And I see... This happens to cameramen. They can get themselves into terrible position because it's not real life. They're looking through a lens. Yeah. And he was falling out the window. He was <gasps> falling backwards. And I jumped across the gap between us and grabbed him by the ankles oh. and stopped him falling out the window. And he's always said since then, he said, I saved his life. Wow. Because he was, he was going out the window. Yeah, that was Save the Last Dance for me. Yeah. 
<laughs> and then, and at, at the end of the episode, you do like a Steven Seagal move on a guy who's got a gun to your head. You know, you, you sort of throw him over your shoulder. You oh, know? yeah. I, 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 yes, I remember it. You see, all this comes from You don't think about it. No. Yeah, I do remember that. I remember that. God, they were wonderful. And I suppose we've got to talk about Ebony, haven't we? Ebony was the puma in an episode. I can't remember what it was called. It was called, uh, When Did You Last See Your Father? was the name of the episode. Ah, well done. I went into a house, and there, in the house, the homeowner was keeping exotic animals. <laughs> To all intents and purposes, I walk into the sitting room and the audience thinks I've come face to face with a black panther. <laughs> That's right. In, in fact, there was a 10 foot perspex screen put down the middle of the room, highly polished. And the camera was positioned in such a way that you couldn't see the screen. But I was not in the same room as a puma. Yeah. I was behind reinforced perspex. Right. So it looked like I was in the room. But then... To publicise that episode, because it was quite a, quite a big deal, this cage was built in the scene dock of the Bill Studios. And a guy turned up with two Black Panthers, Ebony and, and her little mate, to keep her company. Oh, I see. And I was put in the cage, which was done up like a set, uh, like a sitting room, and they were going to take photographs through the bars, so, and in such a way that you wouldn't see... That it was, you know, in a cage. But in fact, those publicity shots were what got in the papers and everything. The guy got me in there and I'm a ludicrously trusting guy. I, I just <laughs> thought, if someone tells me I will be all right, then I believe them. You know, their reputation rests on it. Yeah. It's, but it's not really the brightest thing to do. <laughs> because this is, a, this is a panther. It's huge. I sit on the sofa and it's meant to be, I'm having a cup of tea with the panther. The man, by the way, has got a 12-inch stick oh. piece of bamboo with a little bit of meat stuck on the end. Oh. And it's only when I was sitting in there with the panther, who had now got up on the sofa and was sitting next to me, that I thought, if this goes wrong, <laughs> he's presumably going to... <laughs> poke it with this stick <laughs> which that'll save me but anyway there's a biscuit on the on the saucer and ebony sniffs the biscuit doesn't she oh. so she puts her paw on top of my hand <laughs> and her paw completely covers my hand it's massive it's the size of a boxing glove this paw Whoa. and i can feel her breath and she leans forward and she just gently opens her mouth and starts just chewing like a dog does when it wants to play yeah. on, on my hand. Oh. It's because she's actually trying to get to the biscuit. But I've got my hand in a puma's mouth yeah. and there's a man with a 12 inch bamboo chopstick <laughs> with a bit of meat on it thinking that's going to save me. And the funniest thing of all was afterwards when it was all over and done with the producer had been watching the shoot, and one of the cameramen said, uh, when I got out, he said, uh, when Ebony started chewing your hand, <laughs> the producer turned to him and said, just going to go and check the insurance. <laughs> <laughs> and one went back to his office. <laughs> Wonderful little memories, those. And, and you got reunited with Ebony, you were telling me. Yes. Ebony was moved, bizarrely, to... Painton Zoo, I think it was Painton well, it was Painton Zoo because my brother lived within Lion's Roar of Painton Zoo. It's hysterical. You go to my brother's and sit out and having a barbecue, and you can hear it's like being in this Masai Mara game reserve. Oh, wow. You can hear all the elephants go <laughs> and all the <laughs> all the lions across the valley from Painton Zoo. It's hysterical. Wow. But she was retired there, uh, and I went to see her. Oh. Uh, when she, yeah, she'd be long gone now, of course. It was 20-odd years ago. But, yeah, she was in a, a big enclosure with a couple of other panthers. Yeah, lovely ebony. I, I know you weren't, obviously, happy to be leaving the bill, and that must have been very disappointing. It was disappointing, but only in... Uh, more in hindsight, to be honest, Oliver, because at the time, I thought I'd been in there for eight, nine years. Yeah. I, with a, without an arrogance... I did think I've done enough to 
earn myself more work. Yeah. You know, I thought I'm recognisable enough. The character was enjoyed a lot. I'm going to get work. And hopefully I was hoping then that I was going to move into back into comedy proper. Yeah. And all that. So I wasn't that worried. Mm. But it was only after, you know, sort of six months of being out. And I, I did a, a tour uh, with Josephine Tewson from Keeping Up Appearances. It was a wonderful comedy. Uh, see how they run. Fabulous. Very funny comedy. But it took me out of London for six months. Right. And that was a bad decision. Okay. You needed to be in London so your agent could get you up. And when I came back, it was like out of sight, out of mind. Mm. Um, and it was struggled, to be honest. It was a ba- bad decision, that I should have stayed in London. Were, were you pleased with the storyline? Because I, I watched your last regular episode and some some people in their last stories don't even get a goodbye scene it, it, you know oh absolutely I mean, you, you're in every scene yeah it was part of the furniture wasn't it that's right the antique i've still i've still got the script he's been shipped off made into a detective sergeant and shipped off to the arts and antique squad that's the knockers squad <laughs> as yeah, yeah yeah well that that was going to be my spin-off series yeah i know I thought, you know I did. It was just a little thing in the back of my head. I thought, oh, I wonder if that's what they think. Oh, of course, they weren't thinking that at all. <laughs> but it was a good. It was a good episode. Yeah. And then they gave me a. They gave me a little figurine CID, didn't they? That's uh, right. Like a. That's a little ballerina. <laughs> yes. One of those Art Deco ballerinas, and I got hit behind the door. Yeah, Mr. Conway. Yeah. That, that's that's right. A swing door hit me, and it, when Chris Ellison gives me the figurine. He sort of said the little gift from all of us and everything. And I remember Dashwood's line was, uh, it'll take pride of place on my credenza. <laughs> <laughs> I had to look up credenza. <laughs> but I thought, it's a beautiful Dashwood line, that. Yeah. The fact that he has got a display cabinet at home. And he's a, it just says it all. It was a beautifully written little... But it was. It was a good leaving episode. And I enjoyed it because I wasn't, you know, I didn't realise... It was going to be leaving in more ways than one. You know? No. <laughs> so, you know. And they, 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 they got you back free for free guest appearances. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Until a new executive producer. And I, it, it was hugely enjoyable to go back and have a bet, you know, revisit. Yeah. They got a new producer in who decided that it looked as if the programme was desperate when it kept giving guest appearances to ex-regulars. Right. So he pulled the plug on that and, and stopped that being done. It's a, which is stupid and mm. petty. It doesn't make you look desperate. It's an audience has invested years in those characters, yeah. and I think when one of them comes back, they're going to be very happy and say, "Oh, that's he's back." Yeah. You know, whichever one of us it is, they're going to enjoy seeing them again for another little story. It's it's very short sighted. Yeah. You know, but there you go. It did also. It turned into a very different show mm. after I left. So. You know, in in the latter years, I didn't recognise it. To me, it became very much a, a pr- pretty formulaic police drama again. And I thought, no, oh, no, it's just taking its place among the ranks of police dramas. Whereas the opening premise for the whole series was very simple: everything is seen from the point of view, the POV of a police officer. Yeah. So you never see criminals planning or plotting, or anything. Everything has to be seen through the eyes of a police officer. You don't go into their personal lives. They can bring it to work with them. But that was his premise, and that's what made it different. That's what made it a unique cop show. And when they threw that in the trash can, that idea, and started going into their personal lives Mm. and, you know, the alcohol problems with uh, Mark's character, Carver. Yeah. Uh, which I didn't watch it, but you you can't miss those things. It's I'm still friends with them, so you know, I hear about what's happening, and that's when I think it just became a, a, another cop show, and the writing was on the wall. You go, it's an overcrowded market. It needed a USP. It needed that unique selling point. Yeah, that's what the audience invested in and enjoyed. I think. Well, I can say that you know I've I've got all the network DVDs for Christmas. I've been lapping it up. <laughs> And Good. many years later, A, I'm delighted to be talking to you, but I am so enjoying your work on the show. And I hope it does please you to know mm. that your work is appreciated and still being enjoyed today by new people. It, uh, it's it's lovely, actually. It's, you know, every I think everybody on the planet, no matter what job they do, it's 
that they would like to leave a legacy of some sort. You know, for some people it's family, for some people it's it's art. Um, I I don't know, but that there is a little legacy there that is going to be floating around the internet. Do you know for for a long, long time? I think. I've left a little something, and it's 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 really heartwarming when you say so. Like you're enjoying them coming to the party late, as you said, <laughs> and I think no, it's it's really nice. It's lovely, you know. It, it it was worth it, and I had so much fun doing it, and I have fun in my new the new life now. But uh, it's it's a it's a different life. But that is lovely. Well, as people are enjoying this for free, you're not being paid, I'm not being paid. Is there any charity you support that if people wanted to donate a few quid to? Is there anything you support? And yeah, There is. There is a charity. It's very kind of you. It's the Kit Wilson Animal Rescue Centre. It's the Kit Wilson Trust is how to search for it. It's an animal rescue centre dealing in all sorts of animals, mainly dogs and cats. I'm patron. I'm a patron and have been for about 25 years. So if anybody felt inclined, that would be that would be lovely. Just to finish off, John, what is what is your message to any Bill fans out there? And they are all over the world, these guys, aren't they? Who still love yeah, this program. Yeah. What's your message to them? Thank you for watching. Thank you for enjoying it, because I wouldn't have had a wonderful, wonderful eight years longevity in that show. So it's their commitment to it when they took it on board and took it into their hearts and loved it so much. Now I'm obviously, none of us are involved in it anymore. It doesn't exist. But the fact that people like you and them are still watching it and still enjoying it is really heartwarming. It's lovely. John Isles, thank you so much. Delighted to be talking to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure, Oliver. Thank you. It's been great fun. what a lovely way to kick off the Bill podcast. I'm so grateful to John Isles for giving me his time and for sharing his memories. Absolute legend. You can check out his website, johnisles.net. There's some classic clips from his other roles and some brilliant recordings from his voice work. My thanks also to Mark Stevenson, who facilitated that interview and, and helped John and I set up John's charity, if any of you would like to make a donation to the Kip Wilson Trust, their website is kitwilsontrust.org.uk. It's kitwilsontrust.org.uk. If you fancy making a donation, I'm sure there'll be lots of grateful dogs and cats out there. leave you with a, a bit of music from uh, my friends John, Rich and Colin. They don't really have a band name at the moment so they're using Impromptu. They've recorded a fantastic cover of the Bills theme tune uh, for use in this podcast which I hope you enjoy and I'll stop waffling on now. If you'd like to get in touch, give me any feedback on the podcast. I'm on Twitter at Oliver Crocker. You can find the Facebook page on facebook.com forward slash The Bill Podcast. And we're on soundcloud.com forward slash The Bill Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And you'll hear from another legend very soon. Next time on The Bill Podcast. There was a bar in Wimbledon, right, that used to show The Bill. <laughs> you can see where this is going, right? <laughs> they would show the bill when it was on. It was a big old bar. And they had these booths where the television was right by them. There were several televisions there. but And I deliberately, whilst these episodes were being screened, I would deliberately go into this bar with my friends and sit by the TV. I'm, I'm <laughs> such an idiot. But I would make sure that I was sat right by the TV, sort of facing out towards the bar area and just sort of look at people <laughs> to see if they would clock the TV and then clock me. I mean, who does that? I can't believe I've just admitted that, actually. <laughs>